And we are live. Welcome, mystery and thriller fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeBello, and I am thrilled, pun intended, to host the incredible Allison Brennan today, who's here to tell us about her brand new book, Tell New Tell No Lies, out today. Allison, welcome. Tell us about your book. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm very, very excited. I've been like you really got me excited for the show over the last 24 hours. I was like, going, boy, I can hardly wait. Yay. Um, so uh, Tell No Lies, which I, you know, I, one of, I, I do digress a lot, but one of the great things is when you get your actual book, you know, they come in the mail and they're so pretty and you're like going, oh my gosh, I actually wrote this. I'm, I'm amazed. Um, <laughs> And, and then and you just like want to fondle it. And I know that's probably <laughs> weird, but I, I just love it. Um, the cover and the packaging, they did such a great job. And I think it really conveys. Um, so the book, as you can see from the cover, it looks a little deserty, you know, with the walks and everything. It takes place in a small town called Patagonia, Arizona, south of Tucson. And it's a real town. I um, One of the, the Core story is basically I have a team of FBI agents, the best of the best, that go to rural and underserved communities to investigate complex crimes. Mm. So the first book took place in Liberty Lake, Washington, which is a teeny community outside of Spokane, 7,000 people. This book takes place in Patagonia, Arizona, 1,000 people. And so it starts with what they think is a straightforward murder investigation of a young environmental activist who is killed when she's investigating. Um, uh, she found three dead birds and she is investigating their migratory patterns in order to um, uh, figure out maybe where they were poisoned. She's thinking there are a lot of um, mining down there and there's mm -hmm. a refinery um, that potentially could uh, create the waste that the birds um, could have died from. And it took a lot of research to get this right. Um, but so that starts the book, but then it ends up being a lot more involved and a lot darker storyline than simple toxic dumping. It's not, in fact, it's not exactly what you expect. So it was a lot of fun to write because I love these complex stories where you think it's just one thing, it's just straightforward murder investigation, then it ends up being something much bigger and much darker. I also love those complicated stories. I'm getting Erin Brockovich vibes here of this young woman, uh, you know, exploring why she's finding these these dead birds. She's picking her way through the desertous, uh, the desertous mountains, trying to figure out what could be poisoning those. Um, and I want to get into all of that. And I'm so glad you brought up your research because I want to hear more about that. But I just want to pause and quickly welcome everyone who's watching live. If you've been here before, you know how this works. And if you're new, welcome. We're so thrilled to have you. Here's how it works. Every Tuesday, I present you with two featured authors. And this is your chance to ask these incredible authors anything you want. So Allison Brennan is the New York Times bestselling book, a bestselling author of over 30 books. My God, woman, teach me your ways. Um, and today she's going to tell us all about Tell No Lies. So if you have any questions, just get them going in the comments on either YouTube or Facebook. I can get them right over to Allison. You can ask this incredible author anything. So uh, first comments coming in from YouTube, Margaret saying, ooh, environmental activism, activist murder sounds like a trope for me. Might call attention to something IRL too. Watched Seaspiracy yet. Do you know anything about Seaspiracy? No, I actually haven't been watching a lot of TV. So I have a, my old, no, not my oldest, my fourth child. I have five. My fourth is a senior in high school. And so she's a varsity softball player. Senior year, lots of stuff going on. So something has to give between writing. So I actually haven't watched probably any, I don't think I've watched any TV in other than, you know, late at night reruns or something. Um, in a long time. <laughs> Late at night reruns are also my pandemic comfort food. I, I think I have every line of friends uh, memorized at this point. I just recite them along, but that and a big bowl of popcorn is my happy place. Welcome, Anissa Joy Armstrong. She's giving us all the hearts. Welcome, Diane. Welcome, everyone else. It's so great to have you here. So let's get right into it, Allison. So this book is earning you incredible, you have earned, I should say, incredible praise. Um, so Publishers Weekly is raving um, that 
bestseller Brennan's intriguing sequel to 2020's The Third to Die is fast-paced action with a well-constructed mystery plot. Let's talk about how you construct that well-constructed mystery plot. How do you do it? Uh, a lot of trial and error. So my writing process is not something I recommend to people, mostly because I go in fits and starts mm -hmm. and I don't plot because I find plotting takes away um, a lot of what I, excites me as a writer and is the discovery of what's going on, but I do a lot of revising. So by that, I will, I come up with the premise and I knew what the premise was of this book and I knew how it started. I could completely saw the prologue in my head and I wrote it all out and I didn't quite know how my team was gonna get involved yet. I just knew they that they were gonna be committed to solving Emma's murder. That was, that, and so that was the prologue. Um, and then I write, when I get to the end, I or near the end, I usually have figured it out. I don't always know who the killer is. I do not always know how it all wraps up. I did have a surprise in this book about who was involved in these crimes. I knew one person because I kind of set it up to be this one person. Um, and then when this one person ends up dead, I'm like going, what the heck is going on? I have no idea. So, and that was fun. And it was like, I got to go back and say, okay, what's going on? If it's Ooh. not him, who is it? And so I, and I had fun with that. And one of the great things about having a great editor is that I can send her my book. And if there's anything wrong, um, she's going to say, hey, this scene isn't working or this chapter is too slow or can you expand on this? And then I can go in and I love revisions. I, I really do. I know a lot of authors don't like them, but I love them and I make the book better. It's like, OK, I got the core story here, but she's identified these problems. I'm going to figure out how to fix them. And so that's what I do. Allison, I have so many questions. So first of all, I, I want to hear about how you feel positively about revisions because I'm one of those authors that loathes them. I dread them. I, I hide under the covers and, and find reasons as to why I could not possibly could not possibly do this. Um, love this uh, comment from Bozina saying it sounds like a really enjoyable writing process. Bozina, I love that because. Allison, it does sound enjoyable, but how do you do it? I mean, if you, so you don't plot and I, and I don't write fiction, so I can't imagine, but when you're just seeing where it goes, do you ever find yourself, you know, down a one way dead end street and then you got to back, back, back it up out of there. I mean, how does that work? Um, well, like it is, it is a process. And so I kind of, I edit as I go. So in the morning I start and I read what I, and edit what I wrote the day before. And then I go into the story. And if I ever get stuck, it's usually because I'm forcing my characters or forcing the story along. Ooh. It's not organic. It's not natural. It's not authentic. I mean, and I'm like saying, okay, but I think this has to happen. And if I'm ever writing to a specific scene, that's when I'm having problems. So I might have a vague idea of what's going on and what's happening. But if I'm trying to write to like this big twist, then I, I'm going to have problems. And so I, I try to avoid that. Um, the other thing with revisions is, I mean, I know a lot of authors don't like them. I think that they, a good editor is going to be able to help you make your book better. Mm -hmm. I, they're not going to publish crappy books. And they, and they like your voice enough that they want to publish your book, but they can make your voice stronger, the story stronger. Mm. I tend to ramble sometimes when I talk as well as when I write and they can go through and say, Hey, you already said this three times. Can we like, think, can we cut one of them? I'm like, mm. Oops. <laughs> so that process is, a, it's great. And it really works. I love that. Now, when you said that you were writing this and you were, and you found yourself surprised as to who was involved, no spoilers. We don't want to go that. We don't want to do that. But, but what did you, what did you mean? Did it, did, did it come to you? I mean, do you hear voices and it comes to you? Do you dream it? I mean, how did it surprise you? What's that look like? Um, it's more as I'm writing, I'm sometimes I do think I'm writing myself into a hole and I'm going, Oh my gosh, how am I ever going to get out of this? But I have to then, so then I go back and reread and I get involved in the actual um, investigation myself as if I'm one of the characters. Ooh. And I don't hear the voices so much, but I write deep POV. And what that pretty much means is I put myself in my character's shoes 
and say, okay, what would this character do? It might not be what I did, would do, but what would this yeah. character do? And yeah. then that helps me get over those hurdles. And there are things that don't end up in the book that I spent a lot of time writing and then I realized, mm, that's really not gonna work or that doesn't work for this story. Or this is a great scene and I would love to keep it in the book, but it does not advance the story. And that's where an, a good editor can really help is they're saying, you know, this is, you know, kill your darlings. You have to, sometimes you write the best scene in the world, but it just doesn't do anything. Yes. Oh, I love that. Uh, Margaret Pinard, uh, our fellow author and uh, a valuable member here of the Mighty Blaze team. She specializes in English and Scottish historical fiction saying, revisions are so lonely, Margaret. I think they're lonely too. Um, Allison, you seem like they're, they're not lonely for you. You're having a great time. <laughs> Is that right? I'm actually really looking forward to my editor has my next book and I'm getting revisions any day and I can hardly wait because <laughs> I turned in a book that I think is good and I know there's a couple problems with it. And I actually know, I think after writing nearly 40 books, I kind of know what's working and what isn't, but sometimes you're so close to it that you can't see, okay, what is this? Like in the book I just turned in, um, it's a podcast book. It come, the book comes out at the end of the year. Um, my character is a former U.S. Marshal, and she's helping a podcaster solve a cold case. Well, there's a lot of setup because it's a cold case. It's a cold case mystery. And I'm afraid, is there too much setup at the beginning? Is it too slow at the beginning? What do I need? So the editor, is she is going to be able to say, you know what? you're wrong and this is why I think it works or you know you're right it is a little slow and this is where I think you can trim back or maybe um, you know cut this one whole scene maybe you don't need it at all and I'm so close to the story that I might not see that and so that's what I love about the process. I love that. I love that. And that's actually a perfect lead into our next comment, which is uh, book list raves. Brennan showcases a range of fascinating procedural detail from undercover ops to forensic accounting in the sequel, um, the sequel to The Third to Die. So you actually shared right before we went live that your daughter is uh, is an investigator. Is that where you get uh, all the all the all this accuracy, all of this procedural detail? Do you have others? Tell us, give us the inside scoop. <laughs> I would Tell love to give no lies. <laughs> I would love to give her all the credit, but she's only twenty seven and she's only been in law enforcement for a year. So I started writing seriously when she was thirteen years old, and um, my first book was. Yeah, my first book was published, actually, she was 12. My first book was published when she was 12. And um, maybe because I've always been interested in forensics, she's interest, she was interested in crime and punishment. And she's also very, um, you know, she's like a very guardian personality. She wanted, this is like the perfect job for her. Yay. Um, so she, uh, she does help me though. She did help me with the sorority murder that comes out at the end of the year with some, um, warrant questions I had because she just went through the academy last year. So she is well versed in what you need and when you need it. But I think my research has gone a lot further back. I read widely. I read a lot of true crime. I always have ever since I was 13. And I read In Cold Blood by Truman Capote. Love that book. I read Helter Skelter when I was 14. Um, I read a lot of forensics books. I have a lot of friends in all different um, all different avenues. I've viewed an autopsy. I've turned Quantico. I was involved with the FBI Academy's, uh, the FBI Academy's um, uh, Citizens Academy. Ooh. Yeah. So I, and I, so now I have all these contacts. So when I get stuck, I could say, hey, have you seen the situation? What would you do? Ooh. And I, one of the things I've realized is law enforcement, it, different jurisdictions do things different ways and different cops do things different ways and fbi investigators i remember after i want to say it was my second book or maybe my fourth book i had two emails one from somebody that said oh my gosh an fbi agent would never do that to um and my daughter's a uh, my daughter is this and she said oh that would never happen and then the same day i got an email saying i'm a civilian working for the fbi office and this person is exactly like someone i know <laughs> you know, so I realize it, people are going to have different impressions based right. on 
what their experience is. And so I try to put all that together and create a believable, to me, it has to be plausible. It might not be realistic, but as long as it's plausible, I'll go ahead and do it. I love that. As long as it's plausible. Uh, Margaret from YouTube sharing that she has an author friend who's just gone through the FBI Citizens Academy during the pandemic. I didn't even know there was such a thing. This is so cool. Yeah, they were doing it online uh, this last year because I, I talked to some friends of mine in the Sacramento FBI office, which is where I, I did the academy back in 2008. Ooh, very cool. Anissa from Facebook is wondering, has this always been your writing process since the beginning of your incredible, almost 40 book strong stable of work, or has it changed? It's changed a little bit. I will say it, when I first started writing, there was a lot of joy because you didn't have contracts, deadlines, expectations. There were no expectations. I could just sit down and write. When I committed to writing, I wrote five books in two years while working full time and I have five kids. So I gave up TV. That's why I can give up TV easily. So I gave up TV and I was writing throughout this entire time. And I was just loving it. I would just get you kind of say you like barf it out. You just get the story out and you worry about all the editing later. After about, you know, probably after about 12 or 13 books, that wasn't working for me. I found that I knew the problems as I wrote them and I couldn't just write the book. I couldn't like move forward without fixing the problems. Hmm. So now it probably takes me a little longer to write a book, but it's definitely a cleaner book when I turn it in because I'm editing as I go. I love that. So editing as you go. Thank you, Anissa, top community member here for that excellent question. Let's hop over to YouTube. Margaret saying, a podcaster sleuth, what a fun new angle. Have you done podcasting or interview other podcasters to get a sense of that work? Do you have any recommendations? Well, I read, um, and I, I will say that off the top of my head, I'm not going to think of the names of the podcast, but I went through a bunch of true crime podcasts and listened to them and then read a lot of them have websites where they will tell why they became interested in this idea or this concept uh, or this particular case. So I would listen to their podcasts and then I would read what they said about why they chose to feature that. And so I think I didn't interview any um, largely because of time constraints. I write um, two and a half books a year. And so a lot of times I don't get to go and do everything I want to do. But I did get a sense of how podcasts work, what they, what kind of research they do. And this was for a college project. So he had never done a podcast before. So mm. I had never done a podcast before. So I felt I really understood this character <laughs> and that I could get my former cop character to help him with some of the procedural stuff. Oh, that makes so much sense. I love that. Um, let's hop back over to, uh, to Facebook. Um, Bozina asking, how do you feel about having to give up on some of your ideas and characters? Oh my God, Bozina, you're reading my mind. I was wondering that too, because that's something that I struggle with. And, and then I think, oh, am I dwelling in ego and defensiveness, which is never good for marriage or books, or <laughs> you know, am I just being stubborn and, and hanging on to my guns or am I, you know, sticking my guns or should I, you know, I don't want to be a doormat either and just say, you know, do what you want. How do you find that balance? Um, I think every idea has potential. I mean, you, otherwise you wouldn't have the idea. Mm. Um, for me, I have to think of, is this something that my readers are going to resonate? So before I sold, I didn't care because I didn't have readers. I could write whatever I wanted. Right. Now I do have to kind of be a little conscious in my ideas. However, that said, I generally know if something's good or bad after I kind of mull it through. So mm. if I have a premise, and I can't, if I think I could solve it too quickly, or it would be contrived if I had to extend it out, then I know okay, this one idea might not work. Mm. But often when you have an idea, I, I do recommend people keep like idea files. I don't really have a file per se. I just have like a notebook where I jot down notes, like, you know, a couple of words about something. Like if I read or I see a news program or I read an article, I said, ooh, that's kind of interesting. Like there was one I read, um, a big, huge thing about the happy face murders, whether or not these murders of these young men were actually accidents. They're, they weren't murders. They were, were they accidents or actually a serial killer? And it's a big debate 
and in law enforcement. And there's most cops think, no, these are just accidents. They were drunk. They walked home. They something befell upon them. But there is some people that think they were actually murdered. Mm. And, um, young, healthy men. And so I couldn't come up with a really idea, but it's in my idea book because I'm thinking, you know, that is kind of compelling. If it is this a series of accidents throughout, you know, it basically the Northeast, or is this something else? So maybe someday I'll come up with it. And I think I, now I will say it just, just to add in, I did have to give up a series that I published. I did a Seven Deadly Sins series. It was a supernatural thriller, completely different from what I write now. I absolutely loved it. Loved it, loved writing it, loved the characters. It did not sell very well. So my publisher canceled it. Mm -hmm. That was hard to give up. And, and you think, oh, well, you could have just self-published it. I did self-publish a book. It did not sell very well. And um, I have self-published other books too that have done extremely well um, for, the, for that medium. And I realized my readers weren't going to follow me. And I did not have the time or the energy to be able to cultivate an entire new readership into this entire new genre. Ooh. That was really hard because I loved doing it. But I also recognize I'm a professional writer and I have to write and please the, my, the largest audience I possibly can. So I, it is not an easy thing to do. And it could be very sad. Right. But it's also a business. And so you kind of have to, you got to have to meld the creative mindset with the business mindset, which is really hard, I think, for creative people to do. That's very hard. Thank you for that insight, that authenticity and that honesty. I think that's so important. And I, and I love that transparency. So thank you. Um, thank you for that. It's so great to have the inside scoop. And we know you're not telling us any lies. I'm going to make, make as many puns as I can about this. <laughs> um, Gail, top community member saying, hi, Sarah. Hi, Gail. Welcome back. Uh, Margaret saying she's heard good things about my favorite murder. That's something that I subscribe to, a podcast I subscribe to as well. Um, and I need to make more time in my schedule for listening to listening to podcasts. Um, let's hop over to Facebook. I want to talk about your Kirkus review, which praises your ability to write a lean thriller with a strong and damaged protagonist. Um, so you have you have Kate Quinn, and I'm making sure I, every, I hope it's not backwards when I'm holding it up, um, and 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 the uh, the FBI agent Matt Costa. So what? How do you? First of all, how do you write a lean thriller? I mean, are your drafts actually lean? You said that you ramble sometimes. I, I'm I'm quoting you on that. How, I do. do you cut yourself back, or are you able to produce this leanness on the first go? Oh, it's edits. I mean, honestly, I um. My books are actually, when I do my revisions, my books end up being longer than they were when I turned them in. So I'll turn in a book and it's going to be between 95 and 105,000 words when I turn mm -hmm. it in. Usually when I'm done, it's between 110 and 115. That's like my sweet spot. Okay. But I do a lot of revising and I do a lot of trimming and I go through and I look for those words that I um, repeat all the time. Sometimes I have to cut out swear words because- <laughs> she tends to swear a little bit too much. So I might, you know, she still does, but I might cut out a few of them. Mm. There's words I use as like actually or coincidentally, you know, these, these words that when I'm writing, they just come out or however, my characters always say, however, <laughs> and it's like, however this, or I understand. Why do you have to say you understand? Just don't say anything. So <laughs> I trim all this stuff in revisions. I do read my entire book out loud in Ooh. either in the copy edit stage or in the page per stage. Just depends on what my deadline is. Um, but I'll read the whole book out loud, especially dialogue, because when you're writing dialogue, you're writing. And but when you're speaking, you're going to speak differently than you would write. Yes. And that really helps me. And I think that's probably why the book tends to be a little leaner. Ooh. Um, not, not completely because I do have a lot of narrative, but at the same time, I try to get rid of the extraneous stuff. Oh, I, yes. Oh, I love that. Um, also love this comment from Margaret. She's saying it's so hard to give something up for strategic or business reasons um, to, to reconnect with your core purpose and turn to something new. I think we've all felt the pain of that. Um, so Thank you for again, you know, sharing how you do that. That's 
that's really that's really amazing. Um, we have another comment coming in from uh, Gian. She said she doesn't have any questions, but she just wants you to know she loves your books oh, and good. your Lucy series. She said she's a huge fan of all of your work. Um, so thank you for that, Gian. Um, and oh my goodness, it is time for the lightning round. I'm gonna put our lightning round uh, banner up here. <laughs> so, um, so if you have any last questions, we have just five minutes left with Allison. So get your questions going in the comments, um, and I will get them right over to right over to Allison. Um, so, Allison, what are you working on now while people are thinking of their questions? Well, I am waiting for revisions for two books. I actually have two books with my editor. The third Quinn and Costa book, which is place in the San Juan Islands because they move around. And, yes. so, uh, and I have the whole team is there. And it's there. it starts with an explosion on a charter boat that kills 11 people. And they are sent there because one of them is a retired FBI agent investigating a cold case. And so Ooh. they there to find out, is this an accident or, well, they know it was intentional, but they want to figure out who the target was. Was it the FBI agent? Was it the company, the, the charter boat company who has had some issues with environmental activists up there? And, or is it somebody else? Like the billionaire who was on the boat who left a very young wife. So get this, and I got to put all my characters together and it was so much fun. Um, so I can't wait to get revisions for that. And then the sorority murder comes back out at the end of the year. And I'm also waiting for revisions for that different characters. And then I'm write, writing the next book that my editor tells me to write, whether it's going to be the second Regan Merritt book, which is follows the sorority murder or the Ooh. next book. So I'm waiting with bated breath to find out what I get to write next. I sent her both ideas, so I'm waiting. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. How, Allison, I just have to ask, I mean, 40, nearly 40 books, I'm in awe. I'm still working on book number two. Can you tell us how do you stay creatively inspired, creatively charged? You also have five children. My God, woman, when do you sleep? I mean, how do you not get burnt out writing two and a half books a year? Well, first, because I write two series, that really, really helps. I can go back and forth between the characters and I don't get bored with any one character or setting or concept. That, to me, helps me. Um, and that's actually why I started the Seven Deadly Sins series was because it was a way to do something completely different. But I love crime thrillers and I don't want anybody to, I love what I write. I wouldn't write it if I did not love doing it. Um, and that's ultimately the core. Sometimes it's hard. I mean, it's, it's sometimes it is hard. You get create writer's block. You're frustrated with the business. You don't know what's going on. Book sales fall because your book comes out in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, all these things can happen. But if you love writing, if you just love the create the creative process, you can get through anything. And I do. I love that. Thank you. Um, because especially during a pandemic, I know I've struggled and I know a lot of people are struggling in a lot of different ways. Um, so thank you, thank you for that. Um, I just want everyone to know, Allison has 65, over 65,000 fans on Facebook. Wow, I mean, that's amazing. So if you love Facebook, click over, here's the link, follow Allison, hang out with her on Facebook. If you prefer Instagram, I love me some Instagram. Here's her link to Instagram. If you love to tweet and you like Twitter, hang out with Allison here on Twitter. Um, Allison, what's your relationship with social media? Do you like chatting with people or do you like to sort of keep your head down and keep working? I, I think social media is a great way to just connect and just, I do like chatting. I'm an extrovert. So when I quit my day job, I used to work in the California state legislature. And when I quit that, it was hard. And so social media kind of took over for that, basically the water cooler conversation where I could sit down and chat with people. I don't obsess over it. I don't go on it all the time. I mean, I'll go on every single day just to check to see if I have messages. And I have found though, um, Facebook is where people tend to reach out to me more. So I get more like reader email through Facebook than I do through my website. So I do spend more time on Facebook anywhere else because that's where I, I feel my readers mostly are, but I am also trying to hang out on Instagram because there are some readers there and there's some readers on Twitter. So I will go everywhere um, every day. I just don't spend, you know, well, I don't spend hours on any social media. I'd never get any writing done. <laughs> right. But yeah. 
Well, you can hang out with uh, with Allison on any of these platforms, whatever your pleasure is. You just heard her say she does it all. Again, 65,000 followers, more than 65,000 followers on Facebook. That's incredible. And um, your girl here made a fun little TikTok to Fleetwood Max. Tell me sweet little lies. So you can go check that out on any of our social channels. Uh, it looks like we are out of time. Allison, parting thought, what do you want to leave us with? What do you want people to leave, have, having read your book, what do you want them to feel, to think, to learn? What do you want them to, to, to leave this book with? I want people to be entertained. I write to entertain. I write so that people could, people lead, lead busy lives or they have stressful jobs. I want them to know that my book's justice is always served. And I want them to, when they get to the last page, I want them to close it and say, that was a good book. That's, that's what I want to do. I want to entertain them. I want their time to be well spent. Oh, I love that. I love that so much because I like to be entertained and I love to entertain others. And I think that that sensation of contentment that this was time well spent. This was, you know, and it was afternoons snuggled on the couch, curled up with a good book. It was time well spent. That's a deep sense of satisfaction. And I absolutely love that. Um, so thank you so much, Allison, for that. And thank you for sharing that with us. Everyone, you can grab your copy of Tell No, Li Tell no Lies today through our partnership with bookshop.org, which supports independent bookstores. And they need our support right now. Tragically, one per week has gone out of business since the pandemic descended. So if you want to have bookshops to browse and pages to feel and smell and devour, um, grab your copy of Tell No Lies today through uh, bookshop.org. And I just posted the link in the comments. Allison Brennan, you incredible, magnificent uh, woman of 40, uh, nearly 40 books. Thank you for joining us here today. And please come back and talk to us when your next book is out. Thank you. I would love to.